Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 691 for April 22nd, 2018. Coming up in a few minutes. I'm sure the Pope has enough wine, so I decided to bring him something that Kentucky is known for, and that's its bourbon. Father Jim Sitchko is a Kentucky-based Catholic priest who met with Pope Francis earlier this month at the Vatican and presented the Pope with Pappy. Pappy Van Winkle bourbon, that is. He'll join us later on Whiskey Cast in Depth. And we'll also have a preview of this year's Spirit of Speyside Festival with longtime festival volunteer and board member Ann Miller of Chivas Brothers. I'll also have the calendar of events, your voice, and a new feature this week. We'll go behind the label. All just ahead on Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know know Redbreast. This is whiskey. Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch makers. Creating the bold and complex flavor of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Let's start off with the news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. The world's largest beer company is dipping its toes into the whiskey business. Anheuser-Busch InBev's in-house venture capital unit, ZX Ventures, has acquired Atom Group, That's the UK-based parent company of Master of Malt, Atom Brands, and Maverick Drinks. Of course, Master of Malt was one of the pioneers in online whiskey retailing, while the Atom Brands division produces That Boutique Whiskey Company and other spirits brands, along with the Drinks by the Dram series. And Maverick Drinks handles distribution for those brands, while also importing several U.S. craft whiskey brands into Europe. Adam Group's managing director is Justin Petsaft, and he told me they've rejected a number of suitors over the years, but could not turn down this one. The guys from uh, ZX Ventures uh, just had incredible alignment with, with the way that they did business, um, the, the kind of thing that they wanted to accomplish. Um, and in the end, it was, it was just a really easy decision because they were people that we felt very, very comfortable doing business with. And, and felt uh, really confident uh, would would have the same aims and goals as we did, uh, and so you know we uh, we did a deal with them and uh, delighted to have uh, their support and, and very very excited to uh, to see what we can accomplish together going forward. What do they bring to the table besides, um, shall we say, a lot of money? <laughs> but besides besides the obvious, yeah. <laughs> uh, so. What one of the really exciting things about ZX, I should say that um, ZX is is um, AB InBev's global uh, kind of growth and innovation arm. Um, so so they're looking for businesses which are doing exciting things, and um, they're looking to to back those businesses and invest in them. So so one of the most exciting things about ZX is actually the ecosystem. Um, that there are a number of uh, a number of other companies that they've backed over the last uh, few years. Um, and so it, it's not just uh, financial investment, it, it's actually uh, getting to work with those other incredible startup businesses who have each had you know, different different stories and different paths to, to getting where they're, they're going um, and being able to kind of you know, swap notes, uh, get ideas and, and just be part of, of something which is, which is really broader than, than just a single business is, is very, very exciting for us. This has been seen by a lot of folks as beneficial for them in that uh, you have experience in e-commerce that they don't have within their system yet. Is that pretty much the case, at least what made you guys attractive to them? Yeah, I think um, that, that is definitely um, one of the major reasons that, that we were interesting to them. We've taken a very unusual route uh, to, to, to getting here. Um, you know, we are, in terms of master of malt, we're primarily a technology business uh, that loves whiskey. Um, and, and in fact, I think it was one of our, one of our uh, biggest competitors uh, back in the early days when we were getting started, uh, described them, themselves as a whiskey shop um, who had a website, uh, and described us as, as just a technology business that happened to sell whiskey. Uh, and actually, we, we kind of took that mantle on as, as a badge of honor uh, because we, we've always been about developing cutting edge technology uh, to help empower the 
incredibly passionate band of people we have to deliver an incredible experience. You know, that, that's what Master of Malt as a business is all about, is that end-to-end -end experience. It's not just you know, putting a bottle of whiskey in a box and, and shipping it out. Um, and, and so I think both the technology that we've developed and also our approach to, to experience rather than just traditional retail um, it is something that uh, is, is very interesting for them. And, and I think we have some, some exciting conversations about, about how that can be used more broadly. No purchase price was disclosed, but the entire Atom Group team will be staying on under the new ownership. There will be one major change, though, and since we've been talking a lot in recent weeks about the problems overseas online retailers have had in shipping whiskeys into the United States, it is important to note. Just as the sale was being announced this week, Master of Malt announced separately on its website that it will no longer be shipping orders to the United States, while not giving any reasons. Did this have anything to do with the decision to stop shipping to the U.S.? <laughs> I, I'm going to let you uh, draw your own conclusions uh, on, on that one. Uh, they're, they're certainly uh, certainly correlated in time. Um, I think yeah, the, it's, the reality is that um, the United States is a, is a very complex market, um, and you know, we needed to step back and review um, how, how we, as, as a group of businesses, we're going to approach the U.S. market, um, and, and going forward, uh, the plan is to work with wholesalers and, and retailers who are already based stateside um, to, to deliver the same kind of incredible experience which which our customers have, have come to uh, appreciate and, and value. I think, um, but what I don't want to do is, is kind of give any give any false hope on, on the timeline for that. It, it is a big, complex project. Um, it's something we're committed to, um, but it, it's not something which is going to happen soon. Let's read between the lines for a second. Keep in mind that AB InBev's main business is beer, of course, and the company not only has a major network of independently owned beer distributors around the U.S. that supply beer to bars and retailers, but it also owns distributors in the states where that's legal. And of course, the entire business is very heavily regulated at both the state and federal levels. Shipping distilled spirits directly to U.S. consumers especially from overseas, has always been a really gray area legally. And note that Justin Petsaft indicated that any future U.S. sales would be handled through the existing three-tier system of importers, distributors, and retailers. To put it into layman's terms, I'd hazard a guess that AB InBev's lawyers had a key role in that decision. In other news, we reported last time around that the funding is now in place for Edinburgh's first malt whiskey distillery in 90 years, with the final piece of the $8.25 million project coming from the Scottish Investment Bank, which is the investment arm of Scotland Enterprise. I talked with co-founder Rob Carpenter and head distiller Jack Mayo after the announcement. They're planning to start work at the old engine shed building on St. Leonard's Lane as soon as possible. We'll be in the building uh, doing the renovations and that will take about 12 months. So current target is that we will be operating and open for visitors in June of 2019. I would take it you're excited about this now. Thrilled, absolutely. It's, it's been a lot of work obviously and a few years of work to get through the fundraise, uh, which is obviously a key step, but now the funds start starts and uh, we we can get on with actually building uh, and and then producing and welcoming people to the site so we're we're all very excited explain the significance of uh, where you're building this well our building is a uh, 185 year old uh, building associated with the first railway in Edinburgh but more than that it is uh, right in the middle of where all the breweries and distilleries were in Edinburgh. Uh, they were in an area called the, the Charm Circle, and it's sort of a bit of a saddle between uh, the, the Salisbury Craigs and the castle with fantastic water and so on. So that's why the distillers and brewers all wanted to locate their, their facilities there. And we're right in the middle of that. So it's really quite historic that we've been able to find a building that is in that kind of location. Jack, what's it going to take to convert this 185-year-old uh, building and turn it into a distillery? Structurally, it's in a very good shape, but there is a substantial amount of work to be done. Um, so the, the building is Grade 1 listed, so in the UK that means 
that there's not a lot you can do to the outside at all. Um, so there's a lot of planning that's, that's been gone through already to, to get us to a stage where we're allowed to do what we're doing. Um, internally, a lot of the floors are being removed. Um, most of the exposed stonework is staying in place, um, but we do have a lot of work to do with steel structures and, and then sequencing of inst- installation of equipment, which will take place through a small opening in the roof, um, which we're allowed to, allowed to take off and, and put back on again. Um, but it's a, it's a tight schedule. And as I say, it will be sequenced with quasi-military precision. Exactly. What are you going to try to produce in terms of single malt spirit there? So because there's, there's not any history of this, we've basically been given a blank slate. So we're going to be playing around a lot with what can be achieved within the rules that the FWA sets out and, and outside of that as well. In terms of the single malt production, we're going to be looking at using specialty malts as well as standard distillers malt to bring other flavors. We're going to inevitably look at the peated malt as well um, and look at what can be achieved by, by the monsters. Outside of that, we're also looking beyond distillers malt, so we're going to be looking at brewers east and winery east and further afield as well. Our main aim is to achieve flavor, so we're not necessarily looking for you know, 420 at least of your alcohol per ton. We're not looking for the highest yield possible. We're looking for as much flavor as possible. So it's, it's a blank sheet to start from, and we're very excited to get going with that. Rob Carpenter's wife, Kelly, and longtime Scotch whiskey industry veteran David Robertson are also partners in the distillery project. It'll be the first malt whiskey distillery in the Scottish capital since Glen Sines Distillery closed down in the 1920s. The Carpenters are also the founders of Canada's chapter of the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, which made news in January when its whiskies were seized from four bars in British Columbia by liquor enforcement agents because they'd been purchased directly from the society's retailers in B.C. instead of the provincial liquor distribution agency. And while there's no news to report on the resolution of that case just yet, Canada's unique provincial liquor laws were upheld by Canada's Supreme Court Thursday. The court overturned a New Brunswick court's ruling in favor of a man arrested in 2012 for illegally bringing 14 cases of beer and three bottles of spirits across the border from Quebec, where the difference in taxes usually leads to lower prices. New Brunswick law limits people to importing 12 pints of beer or one bottle of liquor purchased outside the province. And the provincial court ruled that that violated the Canadian Constitution's ban on trade barriers between provinces. The Supreme Court, though, rejected that argument on the grounds that provinces can legally manage the flows of goods for other reasons, such as public health. Now, that ruling could affect more than just liquor sales, since Canadian provinces have their own laws restricting cross-border traffic of everything from dairy products to maple syrup. And it could also affect legal cannabis sales when that takes effect later this year. By the way, the tax difference is not as much when it comes to spirits. For instance, as of this weekend, our check of the websites shows that the SAQ in Quebec sells a 750 ml bottle of Lot 40 for $39.75 Canadian, while the ANBL in New Brunswick prices it at $39.99. But when it comes to beer, the Globe and Mail found Quebec has some of the cheapest prices in Canada, with a 12-pack of Molson Canadian beer selling for $17.99 Canadian at the SAQ, The New Brunswick price is $25.49, while that same 12-pack sells for $30.24 in Saskatchewan. Let's update a story from the last episode now on the return of whiskey distilling to the West Overton Village and Museum in southwestern Pennsylvania near Pittsburgh. As we heard earlier this week, there are plans to build a small educational distillery at the museum, next to the building that housed the old Overholt distillery up until 1951. And there have been rumors going around that production of old Overholt rye might actually return to Pennsylvania from Kentucky, where it's now made at Jim Beam's distilleries. We asked Beam Suntory to comment on those rumors, but did not get a response back in time for Thursday's episode. Beam Suntory spokesman Dan Cohen told me in an email 
that the company has made a donation to help support the West Overton Village and Museum's educational work in rye whiskey history, but is not involved with the plans for that educational distillery. What's more, there are no plans to move distilling or maturation of Old Overholt rye out of Kentucky. But speaking of Pennsylvania rye, the guys at Dad's Hat just north of Philadelphia in Bristol, Pennsylvania, will be coming out with a bottled-in-bond Pennsylvania straight rye in the next few weeks. It's Herman Mihalich's second crack at a bottled-in-bond rye. Last year, we brought out one barrel for a very limited release only at the distillery. This year, we're actually two, we have a, a six or seven barrels that qualify together as Ball and Bond. We're actually inviting uh, representatives from the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board to come down and help us select which barrels are going to make it into the final product. And it will be launched in Pennsylvania and in other selected states up and down the eastern seaboard. When? It'll be by May, before Father's Day. So keep your eye open. It'll be uh, our Ball and Bond will be out by then. And that'll be your first wide-scale bottled and bond rye. That's correct. Right now our straight whiskeys averages between three and four years. We're going to be pushing it next year into a four-year range universally. So the bottle and bond bo uh, bottlings and the straight whiskey will all be pushing over four years now. Any idea, knowing how much of a history buff you are, when was the last time there was a bottled and bond Pennsylvania straight rye? Uh, that's a good question. It was probably back in the 80s, I think, was the last one. It was when Michter's was still operating in Pennsylvania. Yeah, probably. So this will be a landmark then, won't it? Yes, it is. That's why the PLCB, the, the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board, is so interested in having it in their stores because they see that as a, a kind of a nice landmark, you know, for sure. There's no word yet on pricing for the Dad's Hat bottled in Bond Pennsylvania rye. I'll have more details when they're available. Other new whiskeys announced this week. Buffalo Trace is releasing a second and final batch of its E.H. Taylor four-grain bourbon, this is a bottled and bond bourbon matured for 13 years and bottled at 50% ABV. The 2017 edition was named the World Whiskey of the Year in the most recent Whiskey Bible, but there will not be a price increase for the 2018 version. It'll carry the same recommended retail price of around $70 a bottle. Diageo's Orphan Barrel brand is releasing its fifth annual edition of Rhetoric Bourbon, each year's release is a year older than the previous year's, and the 2018 version is 24 years old. It comes from stocks distilled at Louisville's Bernheim Distillery between 1990 and 1993 and matured in the warehouses at nearby Stitzel Weller Distillery. Rhetoric 24-year-old will sell for around $130 a bottle. I received a sample this week, and I'll have my tasting notes for it soon at whiskeycast.com. Balconis Distilling doesn't just make whiskeys, it also makes a Texas rum, and the latest version of that is being released this weekend at the distillery in Waco. But for our purposes, they're also releasing a new single malt that's finished in those rum casks. It's bottled at 55% ABV and will sell for $80 a bottle at the distillery. By the way, that's the same price for the rum, too. Turning to Scotch whiskey now, the Glenlivet's annual Mystery Malt is out. Master distiller Alan Winchester creates a new Mystery Malt each year, but doesn't release any tasting notes, cask details, or anything other than the bottling strength. The previous two editions, Cipher and Alpha, never made it to the U.S., but I was at the New York City release of the Glenlivet Code on Thursday night with brand ambassador Dominic Venegas. Well, as far as I know, we're working with casts that Glenlivet has never worked with before. So I know as much as you do, as far as, uh, as, far as it goes. In terms of what? Basically, what's Alan thinking about when he's trying to put this together? He's trying to use your, sens your sensory, meaning that it's not just based on your nose and, your, and, and what you taste. It's about what you're experiencing, what you're hearing, what you're seeing, who you're with. It's not always about your tasting notes and what you think you know. Now, us playing with new casts that we've never used before, this is a challenge for all of those that think that they do know the Glenlivet. By the way, there is a symbol on the box and bottle that if you scan with the Shazam smartphone app's camera, you'll get an assisted reality experience with Alan Winchester explaining the challenge of the code. 
I'll have my tasting notes for the Glenlivet Code later on. Meanwhile, Ian McLeod Distillers is putting some heat behind its Smokehead Isla single malt brand. In addition to new packaging for the flagship version of Smokehead, there's a new cask strength version that's bottled at 58% ABV. It'll be available worldwide, along with the standard version. The recommended retail price for the cask strength Smokehead is around £55, $78 a bottle, while the standard version remains at £39, that's about $55 a bottle. Edrington is kicking off a new range of the famous Grouse. The cask series will highlight different styles of casks, with the first release being the famous Grouse Bourbon Cask. It'll be available exclusively for now at Tesco stores in the UK for £19 a bottle. That's around 27 bucks at current exchange rates. Beijil, the Isla Festival of Malt and Music, is a little more than a month away, and we're already starting to get details on more of this year's festival bottlings. In addition to the Ardbeg Grooves release that we've already reported on, Lafroig's annual Kerchus release will be a Fino Sherry Cask finished single malt. It'll make its debut during Lafroig's Festival Day on May 29th, and will eventually hit retailers worldwide. And Buna Haven will have two festival exclusives. The Moin Oloroso Peated Whiskey is matured in ex-sherry casks. And there's also a 15-year-old single malt that was distilled in 2002 and finished off in Spanish Oak ex-brandy casks. And most Speyside distilleries don't do festival bottlings for the Spirit of Speyside Festival, but the Speyside Distillery is doing one, it's a Spey 2011 single port cask finish that's bottled with no-chill filtering or coloring at 59.1% ABV. It'll sell at the distillery for 95 pounds a bottle. That's around $133, and they're already taking pre-orders. Once again, we'll have more on the Spirit of Speyside Festival coming up in just a few minutes during Whiskey Cast in Depth. You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park, the Orkney single malt with Viking Soul. Of course, the Vikings took their voyages by ship. But if you're taking a voyage of your own soon by air or ferry, look for the newest Highland Park travel retail release. Voyage of the Raven honors the ravens who helped guide Viking voyagers with their innate navigation skills. It's available now at airport shops in the UK, Europe, India, Asia, and Australia, along with shops on board several Scandinavian ferry lines. Get all of the details at highlandparkwhiskey.com. Time now for the Whiskey Cast Calendar of Events. The Kensington Wine Market in Calgary, Alberta has a Whiskey Wars tasting featuring no age statement whiskies this Wednesday night. And the Whiskey Sisters will host a tasting of classic cask single malts at the Jack Rose Dining Saloon in Washington, D.C. that same night. Copper and Oak in New York City has a Balconis whiskey tasting too. Copper and Oak's sister bar, the Brandy Library, has a Buffalo Trace bourbon dinner with master distiller Harlan Wheatley Thursday night. Tickets are still available. The Whiskey X Chicago is this Friday night in the United Club at Soldier Field. And looking ahead to May, Spirit of Toronto is on May 5th. Whiskey Live Sydney is May 11th and 12th. The London Whiskey Weekender is May 11th through the 13th. And the Whiskey Exchange will host a Cavalan tasting with Ian Chang at Smith & Walensky in London's Covent Garden, May 15th. Right now, we have 282 different events on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. There's bound to be something going on near you. This is whiskey. Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these places in that place. These are the people that make it. Aging at Gain Oak for 12 long years. See, the land that shapes these people and the people that shape this whisky all shape how bloody good it tastes. Bold as it is complex. For every step you take, this is Johnny Walker Black Label, friends. Step right up. Can I drink this now? Johnny Walker Black Label Blended Scotch Whisky. 40% alcohol by volume. 
imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Coming up later on, the debut of Behind the Label, as we dig into some of the things that whiskey lovers debate most to get the backstory. Right now, Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. In just a few minutes, we'll meet Father Jim Sitchko and hear the story of how he presented Pope Francis with a bottle of 23-year-old Pappy Van Winkle bourbon and a few more bottles to boot. But first, the annual Spirit of Speyside Festival is just a few days away. The festival takes over all of Scotland's Speyside region from May 3rd through the 7th, with more than 500 different events on this year's schedule. That makes it one of the biggest whiskey festivals anywhere. Normally, when we hear from Ann Miller of Chivas Brothers, it's in connection with her role as Aberlauer's Global Brand Ambassador. But she's also been a longtime volunteer and board member for the Spirit of Speyside Festival, and she's watched it grow over the years. There have been some interesting uh, candidates for the best new event uh, competition this year. So we've got uh, a whiskey and tasting following a round of golf. We've got an event which takes you behind the scenes at Glen Murray Distillery, which is uh, uh, an interesting opportunity for people who are whiskey enthusiasts. Um, an off the beaten track t- tour happening um, around some of the distilleries which belong to Shivers Brothers, which are never normally open to visitors. So um, these are events which whiskey enthusiasts find irresistible, I think. And that will include um, a delicious lunch prepared by a specialist in matching food and um, spicy food and whiskies. At the Glenlivet, we've got a speed dating event where we will have um, five managers, the master distiller and uh, the present manager of the distillery and three of his predecessors, all taking uh, it in turns to talk to people who come to the festival over a special dram with which they're associated. And there are some very special drams in that lineup. So uh, that will be a fascinating opportunity to ask anything you like of somebody who's uh, been intimately associated with producing this iconic um, whiskey over the last 30 years or so. And then the final one is a moonlit or possibly moonlit, we'll see walk, an evening walk close to Craig Ellicke, which includes some drams and led by a couple of whiskey enthusiasts. So it's um, a diverse range. But uh, in addition, there are events for people who are not um, you know, great experts on whiskey. Uh, there's music, there's, uh, there's whiskey dinners, there's uh, whiskey paired with chocolate and cheese and, uh, and donuts this year too, a whiskey and donut tasting which will be an entertaining alternative to some of the more serious events. And you mentioned the uh, tour that you're doing at the Chivas Brothers Distilleries. This is the one time of the year when a lot of the space side distilleries that normally are not open to the public do open up, right? That's right. I mean, I speaking with my Chivas Brothers hat on, I have been able to persuade um, our the story manages to open the doors of quite a number of distilleries, uh, including Glen Tocher's, which is the first this year. Um, but we're not alone. There are a lot of distilleries who are doing the same. Or if they are open to visitors, generally for part or all of the year, they are offering special behind-the-scenes tours and events in order to show something that wouldn't normally be available. At the Glenlivet, we're going to be running our small still again, so showing people how whiskey used to be produced in the days of smugglers. There'll be a botanical walk uh, to the source of the water or towards the source of the water, which is used at Abelau Distillery, and a whole range of other things too. While hotel rooms in Speyside may be hard to come by at this late date, there are still tickets available for many of the festival's events, You'll find a link to the Spirit of Speyside Festival's website in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. Now, what would you give the person who has everything? Or, in this case, a person who takes his priestly vow of poverty seriously. When he was elected Pope five years ago following the resignation of Pope Benedict, Pope Francis issued many of the trappings of his predecessors but it appears that he may well enjoy a bit of the water of life from time to time, 
at least by the expression on his face in an official Vatican photo released April 10th, when Kentucky-based priest Father Jim Sitchko had an audience with him at the Vatican and presented the Pope with a bottle of what will somewhat irreverently refer to as Kentucky's holy water, Happy Van Winkle 23-year-old bourbon. Father Jim spends most of his time on the road as a motivational speaker and one of the Vatican's missionaries of mercy. I caught up with him this week while he was in Denver. Tell me the story of Pappy and the Pope. Sure. So I knew that I was going to be heading over to Rome and that I would have the opportunity to meet the Holy Father as one of his missionaries of mercy. And of course, I, I, I'm Italian, and anytime I go somewhere, uh, especially to a place of honor, I always bring something, uh, a gift, uh, uh, you know, a housewarming gift. And so I decided, uh, I'm sure the Pope has enough wine, so I decided to bring him something that Kentucky is known for, and that's its bourbon. And uh, I have heard much about Pappy Van Winkle's bourbon, and so I decided that was the uh, bourbon I was going to choose. And I had a friend who had a connection, and they got me the bottle, the 23-year bottle. They got me some 17-year bottles, I believe, and um, a 21-year, I believe, and then some other bourbons I got, and I uh, packaged them into the suitcases. I found out what the federal laws were and all of that, and how much I could take and what proof, et cetera, et cetera. And I divided them into my suitcase. And uh, when I got to Rome, I made it through um, security and uh, passport control. And uh, on Sunday, I had mass with the Holy Father and we took a selfie together. He knew I was from Kentucky. And then on Tuesday, we had private uh, audience with uh, the Holy Father. And so when I went up to shake his hand, he said, oh, from Kentucky. I said, yes. And I showed him and he exclaimed, they all exclaimed, everyone around him, bourbon and a good bourbon. And uh, I said, yes, Holy Father, and this is for you from the great state of, of Kentucky and my old Kentucky home. And so uh, he took it with a smile on his face and beautiful pictures of, of me holding the bottle and him holding the bottle as well. What do you think he did with it? Uh, do you know if he's opened it yet, or if he's going to open it, or what he's going to do? I trust that it will stay uh, in his possession, in his um, uh, among him and his confreres, uh, probably his closest secretary and those individuals. And I believe that uh, on a special occasion uh, that will be opened. I was going to ask, uh, how did you manage to get your hands on Pappy Van Winkle? And uh, in this case, using the phrase, the Lord works in mysterious ways, does not count. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, I knew someone who knew Julian Van Winkle. And um, Julian has been very kind to me. And uh, even after, uh, as soon as I handed the Holy Father uh, the Pappies, I uh, was able to text Julian and, and let him know that. And, uh, you know, he responded, grazia, you know, Father Jim, you know, we don't need the publicity because of the lack of product, but this is way cool. And then um, afterwards, when I got back, uh, he had asked me, when I went back to where I was staying at the Vatican, he asked me, do you think you could get a picture of the, the Pope sipping some of it as, as well? And I, you know, I wish I was able to, but my schedule wasn't permitting that. Um, but uh, it, it, it was through a great friend of, of a friend. So I, I was very pleased with that. You realize they're going to invite you back a lot more often now. <laughs> do you know what's interesting? I got to tell you, I've lived in Kentucky 20 years. I'm a transplant to Kentucky, and I've never had bourbon. So I, I uh, you know, I'm not a connoisseur of it, but I, uh, I will from now on be uh, toasting a glass uh, to the Holy Father and to the people who have been so great to me in Kentucky. And if I remember correctly, in Italian, they refer to the Pope as Il Papa, correct? Il Papa, Papa, Papa Francesco. Yes. Il Papa Francesco and Il Papi for Il Papa, correct? That's right. You got it. That, uh, uh, well, I think one person was saying, you know, 
uh, the big pappy got the gold, you know, the big Pope got the good pappy or something of that nature. Now, we know the Vatican has likely a very good wine collection. Do yeah. you know if they have a whiskey cellar? Well, let me tell you what. They, they're going to start one, I can tell you that, because uh, every time I come over now, I'll be bringing them various bourbons. So uh, they know that as a fact. And you brought more than just Pappy, correct? Uh, I brought about 10 bottles. I brought Pappy's. I brought Woodford Reserve Derby Edition. I brought Four Roses. I brought Knob Creek. And uh, those are the ones that I chose and select. You didn't take Maker's Mark with the, the Sisters of Loretto and all that connection in that town? You know, I did not. And, and no offense to that, but, you know, I thought that everyone had um, a, a sense of um, Maker's Mark. No, no offense to them, but I, I just wanted something, well, what could I say, just a little bit more top shelf, if, if that is the correct term. And, and, and again, you've got to realize you're talking to someone who's not, um, a connoisseur of, of, of bourbon. So it was nothing slighted. It's it just I had heard a lot of this um, talk about how difficult Pappy's was to get and various things. And I thought, you know, for the Holy Father, um, that would be something special to present him. Now, if Pope Francis decides to make a pilgrimage to the United States again and visits Kentucky this time, we know why he's coming, right? <laughs> that is great. And and we would welcome him with open arms and he would love it. And and he knows Kentucky and and he knows of the hospitality and the love. So he would enjoy that greatly. By the way, don't be surprised if Pope Francis knows a little more than he lets on about whiskey in general. Before he became a priest, the Pope worked as a chemistry lab technician for a food company in his native Argentina so presumably he learned a bit about distilling. Then again, he also worked as a bouncer in a bar. And that's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, Isla's legendary single malt. The 2018 batch of cask strength Lagavulin 12 year old is coming later this year as part of Diageo's annual special releases series. But while you're waiting for it, you can find the classic Lagavulin 16 year old the Distiller's Edition, and the 8-year-old Lagavulin at a whiskey shop near you. Find out more at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Let's start off with the Glenlivet Code that we heard about a few minutes ago during the news. The only thing we know about it right now is that it's bottled at 48% ABV. But the nose is soft with touches of dried flowers, molasses, vanilla, honey, and muted spices. The taste, though, is anything but muted. It's nice and spicy with cinnamon and ginger root, along with notes of orange marmalade, pineapple, and a touch of toasted coconut. The finish is long with a lingering spiciness, toasted coconut, and a soft spiciness. I'm scoring the Glenlivet Code a 92. Now, Ann Miller mentioned Glenn Murray briefly a couple of minutes ago during Whiskey Cast in Depth. So let's look at the Glenn Murray 18 year old. It's bottled at 47.2% ABV, and the nose is aromatic and fruity with notes of peaches, apples, soft spices, honey, and a hint of shortbread cookies. The taste is thick and nectar like with good fruity notes and spices that build up slowly to a strong crescendo. It's very vibrant and luscious, and the finish is long and fruity with lingering spices in the background. I'm scoring the Glen Murray 18-year-old a 93. I'll have more tasting notes for you in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, proud to announce the release of a new series of Old Fitzgerald Bottled in Bond bourbons. Bottled in an ornate decanter inspired by a 1950s original, it carries on the legacy of John E. Fitzgerald and his act of larceny. Learn more at heavenhilldistillery.com slash blog. And think wisely, drink wisely. Back in January, during episode 677, we met Bob Baxter and Alan Hansen, 
the guys behind Yukon Brewing's Two Brewers Single Malt Whiskies. They've just released batch number nine. It's a single malt finished in sherry casks. But I recently received a sample of batch number eight from their innovative series, a hopped single malt in which hops were added to the wort before a fermentation. Only 920 bottles were released in the Yukon and Alberta at 43% ABV. The nose has notes of honey, citrus, and touches of cilantro and vanilla. While the taste has good spices, a lemony touch of hoppiness, and notes of honey, vanilla, and brown sugar in the background. The finish is medium length, slightly tart and aromatic, and I'm scoring the two brewers batch number 8 an 87. And finally, Sagamore Spirit Distillery in Baltimore is celebrating its first anniversary this weekend. I had the chance to try their Double Oak Dry Whiskey. It's bottled at 48.3% ABV and was originally distilled at MGP, but finished off in new charred oak casks. The taste is oaky and dry with notes of caramel, honey, brown sugar, molasses, and subtle spices. The taste is thick and spicy, though, with clove, cinnamon, allspice, and a hint of ginger, balanced nicely by honey, vanilla, brown sugar, and molasses notes. The finish is medium length and well balanced, with subtle lingering spices and just a touch of honey sweetness. I'm scoring the Sagamore Spirit Double Oak Dry a 91. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. You'll find my tasting notes for more than 2,100 different whiskeys at whiskeycast.com. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreastless Stow Edition, a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Le Stow. Carrying Redbreast's trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Listeau edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that would be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Let's open up the inbox now for this week's Your Voice, brought to you by Lot 40. If you haven't heard by now, Whiskey Cast is now available twice a week. With our new midweek show, in addition to the usual weekend podcast, we've decided that there's so much whiskey news out there that it makes sense to do two shows each week, instead of trying to cram everything into one longer show. And judging by the feedback so far, it looks like many of you like that idea. I jokingly asked on Twitter the other day, how much whiskey cast is too much? Judd Laughter in Knoxville, Tennessee, sent along this response. I think you can go back to the classic definition of a dram, an amount pleasing to both host and guest. In short, I think we'll take as much as you're willing to give. Drew Quesada from Southern California posted this on our Facebook page. The whiskey gods smile on me this evening with this news. And also from our Facebook page, Daniel Brown added this. As long as it doesn't cause too much trouble for you, Mark, I'd love to hear more. Thanks for bringing such consistently great programming. Daniel, thank you for the kind words, and would also like to thank everyone else who commented on the change. It's a team effort that makes WhiskeyCast possible, and we are all truly grateful for your support. By the way, we are running a poll on Twitter right now. How many episodes of WhiskeyCast would you like to have each week? You can find it at the top of the WhiskeyCast timeline on Twitter, and we're also on Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. If there's anything else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always post it on the Your Voice page at whiskeycast.com or just email us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Your Voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. You may have noticed that we have moved around many of the segments that make up each episode of Whiskey Cast, and we'd like to get your feedback on those changes too. But right now it's time to kick off our newest segment. Behind the Label is our chance to look at some of the stories behind many of the things whiskey lovers discuss when they get together. 
We'll cover a wide range of topics on whiskey history, innovation, and education, starting with a look this time around at the practice of chill filtering. That's taking a whiskey that's ready for bottling and cooling it down to just a few degrees above the freezing point of water, then forcing the liquid through a filter. Back in the fall of 2008, I was in the lab at Buffalo Trace Distillery with then-head chemist Truman Cox. He explained the chemistry behind chill filtering and flocculation. There are things in the alcohol, uh, in the whiskey when it's dumped out of the barrel, that are alcohol soluble but not necessarily water soluble. Um, the industry standards always said these are fatty acids, and, and for the most part that is true. And what these fatty acids do, they add that mouth coating thickness to a bourbon. Um, this is why a lot of people like their uncut, unfiltered, like Stag, um, the William Lou Weller, Thomas Handy, Booker's, it's out there as well. Um, but once water is added to whiskey as it comes out of the barrel at say 130 proof and we cut it down to 90 proof, these fatty acids are no longer water soluble and they start coming out and look like a thick haze. And uh, if left for long enough on a shelf, it'll end up looking like a little bit of scum on the bottom or uh, they, they actually flocculate out. So. It's more for an aesthetic reason that these things have to be filtered. We understand, or at least I understand, that the uh, general public is looking for an unfiltered whiskey to get all that full flavorness, flavor, but as we cut things down to the normal bottling proof, it's going to create that haze that's just not going to look appealing to your average consumer on the shelf. So when people complain that, hey, the whiskey's filtered, you have, you have a compromise between keeping the average whiskey consumer happy and keeping the connoisseurs happy. That is correct. And in part, in fact, in a large part, that's the reason we release things like the Stag, the Weller, and the uh, Thomas Handy in an uncut, unfiltered, to uh, really get that uh, connoisseur and, and introduce the full flavor available to the average consumer. A couple of years after that interview, Truman Cox was named Master Distiller at Sazerac's A. Smith Bowman Distillery in Virginia. He passed away in February of 2013, leaving behind a legacy of hard work and great friends. And a few months before he died, we produced a Whiskey Cast HD segment showing him performing his trademark bourbon barrel dance routine at the Kentucky Bourbon Festival. You can watch it at whiskeycast.com or on YouTube. Now, if you have a topic you'd like us to address on Behind the Label, all you have to do is email us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Of course, we have links to years worth of WhiskeyCast HD episodes and our WhiskeyCast tasting panel podcasts at whiskeycast.com, along with the latest whiskey news, events, and a whole lot more. And once again, we'd really like to know what you think of this new format for Whiskey Cast. Let us know online at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or Tumblr. Or just shoot us an email. That address again is comments at whiskeycast.com. This is Whiskey, Johnny Walker's Scotch Whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch Makers, creating the bold and complex flavor of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Whiskey Cast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2018, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, Please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.